Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us for this special webinar as part of Learning at Work Week. My name is Sue Parr and I'm Head of Executive Education at the Open University Business School. I'm delighted to be hosting today's session and equally delighted to be joined by my colleague Eileen Arney who is Lecturer in Human Resource Management in the Business School. Hello everyone, really delighted to be here with you. Um, looking forward very much to your questions and to discussing them with you. Over the next half an hour, we want to share with you some of our perspectives and thoughts on helping line managers to develop people management skills, and we hope you'll find this interesting and thought-provoking, and I'm already seeing some good ideas coming from yourselves too. The webinars we're hosting today form part of a wider set of activities taking place during Learning at Work Week, which has been running through the whole of this week. This initiative, which we're very proud to be involved in, is coordinated by the Campaign for Learning and is an annual opportunity to celebrate and promote the benefits of workplace learning. All sorts of organisations are running activities during this week, so thank you very much for taking the time to join us here in this forum today. You'll be able to interact with us, as you've probably seen already during this webinar, in a number of ways. You'll see on your screen a chat panel, and we invite you to share your questions there. Thank you for the ones that are coming in already. We'll try and answer as many of those as we possibly can. You also have the chance to participate in a couple of polls this morning, and we'll be handing over to our technical manager, Barbara, to launch those during the course of the next 30 minutes. Just a quick reminder that this webinar will be recorded and will be available online after this session. So if you have any colleagues who weren't able to join us now, you can share this with them. And we also welcome you to tweet your thoughts and perspectives on this webinar. You'll see the details for this at the top of your screen now. During this webinar, Eileen will be talking about how to get engaged uh, people, how to provide good leadership and management, how to help people to learn and continue to learn, and how to manage the many work pressures. So, over to Eileen for her first video on getting the most out of people. The way you carry out your role as a manager can make a dramatic difference to the way the people who work for you feel about their work and the way they carry it out. It can make the difference between a workplace where workers simply do what they are asked to do and one where they are fully engaged and willing to make an extra effort to get a good result. When you are able to help your staff to be fully motivated and committed to their work, there can be a dramatic improvement in their performance. Because the people who work for an organisation are so often its most important asset, improvements in their performance can often lead to very big improvements in the overall success of the organisation. One important factor in making employees feel engaged and committed is making them feel valued at work. For example, the way jobs are designed can have quite an important impact on feelings of satisfaction and motivation. Flexible working arrangements, such as part-time and home working, can also help. It matters too that employees feel comfortable in their workplace. With an increasingly diverse workforce, you will need to pay attention to individuals' different needs and also think about how to encourage the unique contributions each can make. This often means being very determined to understand different perspectives, whether caused by age, gender or different ethnic origins, for example, and being proactive in ensuring fairness between groups and equal opportunities for all employees. It also means being very committed to communicating well, not just explaining but also listening very actively to what is said. We know that where employees are able to express their views at work, even when those views are challenging, they are more likely to feel engaged and motivated. When they feel that they are listened to and that their opinion matters. This is sometimes known as employee voice and you, more than anyone, can make those who work for you feel that they have a voice and that it matters.
Thanks very much, Eileen. A lot, hopefully, that we can discuss there. But before we do, I'd like to ask Barbara to launch our first poll. Uh, as you can see, what makes you feel motivated at work? A, feeling that your views are listened to. B, feeling that the contribution you make is valued. C, feeling that your work is interesting and varied. And D, feeling that you're treated fairly. Be very interested to see the results of this poll, um, and we'll bring those to you shortly. I mean, I know that having an engaged workforce is certainly one of the things that uh, distinguishes, as the number of reports have shown, successful companies from, from maybe the less successful. Uh, any sort of feelings as to what helps um, strengthen that engagement? Well, I suppose one of the most important things, really, is making people feel that they matter, making, making them feel that they listen to, making them feel that um, they are an important part of the workforce. Um, so communication is fundamental to that. And, and as I said in my video, really, it's about paying attention to individuals, valuing their individual contributions, and thinking of ways of, of making them feel that they really want to give us their best and go the extra mile for the organization. Thank you. I'm picking up some questions from some of uh, our listeners. Um, one of them was about the difference between tools and techniques and just sort of innate capability and personality. And how far can the tools and techniques that we may be talking about help people? And how much is it sort of naturally instinctive? Uh, good or bad management skills. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. So uh, uh, it's about where the, the innate skills of the manager. Is that what you're Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's obviously true, isn't it, that some people have a very natural skill for managing and leading others. And, and quite often that innate skill is something to do with your ability to empathize with other people, to get a good sense of how they're going to respond and how they feel and how to get the best out of them. And it's quite true that some, some managers, some leaders, are better instinctively at those skills. But I think the important message here is that all managers can develop those skills. And I think one of the ideas about management, which we're, we've been thinking a lot about recently, is how do you help managers to get the best out of the people around them? And how do you get managers who are always really focused quite rightly on getting the task done to find the, the capacity and uh, the, the skills, I suppose, to also focus on the people who are delivering that task and, 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 and how to tune into them and help them to deliver? Thank you. We've got some results from the poll, which I'll uh, just read to you, and then we'll pick up perhaps more questions after that. So I think you'll see the results shortly. But uh, feeling that you're fairly treated is showing as 5%. Feeling that your views are listened to, 10%. Feeling that your work is interesting and varied, 23.3%. And feeling that the contribution you make is valued, so 61.7%. Clearly the most important. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm sure some people will say that a combination of some of those is important. But clearly the most thing at the moment is the contribution you make is valued. And, and that makes the point perfectly, doesn't it? You know, uh, if you feel that you go to work and you do whatever you do, and most of us, let's face it, come to work to try and do a good job. And if you feel at the end of the day, yeah, actually what I did was valued you feel better about it. And I think that's really what the poll is telling us. And I think the point here is that it, for most of us, actually, it is our manager, really, who more than anyone else gives us that sense that what we did was valued. I see that there's an interesting question here uh, from, from Jenny saying, um, interesting poll question, but my answer is modified over time in my career. I think I could relate to that. Do you think that's a fair um, assumption too? Uh, well, I don't know um, how, how Jenny's views have modified, but I could imagine that it would be the case when you're newer to the workplace or to any workplace that you're going to be a little bit more dependent on getting that support. And then maybe as you're more experienced, you learn how to manage your feelings without depending on somebody else giving you feedback and support. And that's quite an, a 
that's quite an interesting area, I think, to explore because for all of us, you know, we're talking about management skills today, um, but most managers are also followers, and so all of us have to develop the ability to give leadership and to provide management support, and we've also got to find a way of managing ourselves so that we can cope with whatever environment we're in. So, so yeah, I do see that. Thank you very much. I think we should be able to go over to the next um, video, Eileen, so we'll see that shortly. As a frontline manager, you will be a leader as well as a manager, and your skill in both these areas is very important. It is sometimes assumed that only senior managers need to have leadership skills, but nothing could be further from the truth. It is also sometimes assumed that leadership skills are somehow more important than management skills, but this is not the case. By leadership, I mean doing things better through motivating or inspiring people, perhaps to do things in a new or different way, in times of change, for example. Management, on the other hand, is more about the effective operation of procedures and systems. Both are important and are two sides of the same coin. It is the quality of both the management and the leadership provided by you as a line manager which most influences the way those who work for you feel about their organisation and their willingness to work hard to achieve their objectives. There are many theories about what makes a good leader and I want to focus here on one important aspect of leadership, your ability to manage emotions and relationships. This ability as a leader matters very much because it so directly affects the quality of the interactions between you and those who work for you. To manage your impact on others, you need first to understand the effect of your behaviours and even of your emotional state. For most of us, this means developing our self-awareness, our understanding of our own responses to the situations we find ourselves in. It also means developing our ability to empathise with others. In other words, to be able to understand and respond to their reactions. None of this is easy in a busy and demanding role. As a manager too, self-management is important. Your ability to manage your time and your workload and to keep stress levels under control will make a great difference to your ability to manage well and to be a good model in the workplace of motivation and commitment. Thank you very much, Arlene. Um, I think there seem to be quite a lot of questions coming in here about how you can balance, when you're leading a team, how you can balance the different needs of the team uh, and treat equally fairly everyone within that team. Any thoughts around that? Well, I think they're different things. I think treating people equally doesn't mean treating people the same. It means the, the important thing for any manager is to make sure that you treat people in a way that enables them to give us their best. And for each individual, what they need you to do will be different. So equally doesn't mean the same, and therefore there's no, no tension between treating people in a way that's fair and, and meets their individual needs, and also giving them whatever they need to, to deliver. I think that, that's how I would put it. Um, and some interesting questions coming in here. Uh, one here, to what extent do you believe that a competitive environment among line managers, it, uh, managers is a motivating factor? Uh, sorry, can you say that again? To what extent do you believe that a competitive environment is motivating? Uh, for individuals, uh, well, it depends on the individuals. Some environments are highly competitive, and the people who are drawn to those environments are often people who thrive on that. I guess I'm going to go back to what I've already said, which is you have to know your people and respond to their needs. Some groups, some cultures uh, are cultures in which people are, are expected to compete and that works well. In other environments, there's a much stronger emphasis on collegiality and, and working in harmony. May I pick up a question which I just noticed, which is a question about how can you uh, 
make people feel anything? And I think that is a great question. It's a really important idea that for all of us in managing ourselves, really important idea to hang on to that uh, nobody can make you feel anything. No, they can't. If you take you know, control of yourself, uh, what you feel is down to you. But it's definitely true, isn't it, that sometimes you have an interaction at work and you go away thinking, that wasn't great. And you have to work fairly hard to deal with it. So the point about management behaviors is, you know, as a manager, we all want to behave in ways that don't give people the challenge of, you know, trying not to be annoyed with us, trying not to be upset by us. I think there are also a number of questions coming here about the role that the team can play mm. in being supportive or creating that culture um, of support that you were talking about too. What's the impact they can have? <coughs> Is it just the manager or are others going to have some impact too? In a, in a, in a working environment which is characterized by teamwork, then you will ideally get a great deal of support from your colleagues. And we all know that one of the, um, one of the things which, which distinguishes between a, a workplace which is productive and, and a workplace that isn't is that colleagues manage to work together. I guess as a manager, you know, you, you're not trying to make everything revolve around you. You're trying to be the person who enables a supportive and cooperative culture to develop. Um, but of course, you know, it does rather depend on the culture you're trying to work with, as I said earlier. Thank you. I'm getting a, a, a great questions coming in here, and so many of them. But I think I will just launch the next um, video, um, and we'll come back to these as many as we possibly can after the next video. I'm here. In a fast-changing world, all of us have to keep learning new ways of working and new ways of doing things. For many companies, this commitment to constant learning and to continuously creating and sharing new knowledge is an important way of achieving a competitive edge. As in so many other areas, it is you as a frontline manager who can really make the difference to the way those who work for you respond to the challenge of continuously learning and sharing knowledge. Sometimes this can be achieved through training courses. Your employer may also sponsor learning through professional development schemes and apprenticeships, for example. The larger part of learning in most organisations, though, is informal and happens constantly in the workplace. And you will have an important role in creating a culture where this learning can take place. This means a culture where, when mistakes happen, people feel able to admit to them rather than hide them, for example, so the reasons for problems can be identified and addressed. It also means a culture where feedback can be given and received without offence. Your own ability to give feedback skillfully can be very important here. That is, to be specific about what has happened, to indicate what might be done differently, and to do all this without blaming and judgement your own willingness to encourage feedback and to receive it without defensiveness or blaming matters too. Your management of performance appraisal or review systems, where these exist in your organisation, can be important in identifying and addressing learning needs. Performance reviews, by the way, are a classic example of a management task which can have a profound impact, for good or ill, on employee performance and it's really important to carry them out efficiently as well as effectively. Once learning needs have been identified, there are many ways these can be addressed. Individual learning needs can often be addressed through coaching and mentoring in the workplace. And you will often yourself be in a coaching or mentoring role. You will, in fact, certainly use coaching and mentoring skills in the performance review process itself as you help employees to take responsibility for identifying and addressing their learning needs. Sometimes, where new skills need to be developed or new challenges met, you may turn to collaborative learning in workshops and in teams. 
There are also many new and innovative ways of learning in the workplace. E-learning and social media provide opportunities for flexible and accessible learning which can complement face-to-face learning. And massive open online courses or MOOCs offer potential for free online learning. Thanks so much, Eileen. A lot to think about there. And thank you, too, for all the questions that are coming in. We'll try and get through some more of those after this second poll. So poll two, what are the most important ways for you of learning in the workplace? A, coaching or mentoring. B, learning on your own from your own experience. C, face-to-face -face courses. And D, learning in virtual environments. Thank you. Some questions have certainly been coming in, I think, about some of the ways of maybe learning, but also helping your a team. Things like mindfulness, coaching, 360, emotional intelligence, behavioral. Um, there are a lot of questions as to what your thoughts might be about the, the value and um, usefulness of any of those. Yeah, most of those are techniques, I think, for raising self-awareness, and I guess it's a fundamental idea, isn't it, that um, if you're going to behave in ways at work that help other people to feel positive, you need to know the impact of your behaviors. And so 360 degree feedback is quite a well-established way of enabling people to give feedback anonymously. It has its problems. It's very hard to make it genuinely anonymous. But if you as the person receiving the feedback approach it positively, you, you can, if you're determined about it, get some really good learning out of it. So yeah, of course, um, it, 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 it is important to develop your awareness of yourself and, you, and the way you behave and the way others perceive it. To some extent, once you've got that awareness, you can manage your behaviors, and to some extent, you can't. We are all who we are, but uh, yeah, all of those very useful techniques. Thank you very much. There was a question a little bit earlier about how you manage to um, develop, encourage, retain some of those sort of new, inexperienced people coming in, but who are eager to get on and uh, may not necessarily feel that they want to wait very long to, to make such a How do you encourage them? Yes. I mean, I guess if you come into a workplace and you're really, really keen to get on, um, then the sorts of skills we've been talking about become quite important because it can be quite disruptive in a workplace if newcomers really want to do better than everybody else. But, you know, this is part of... Um, it's Kerry, I think, from UL, who already met, talked to us about um, emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence... I know it's a contested term, but the idea behind it, that really in the workplace, interacting with a lot of people, you have to find ways of doing that in a way that's constructive for you and for them. And when you start off in the workplace, you don't necessarily know that. You know, a couple of people said earlier, um, you know, answers to some of these poll questions change over time, and behaviors in the workplace change over time. So I guess the line manager, you know, you support people and help them to learn those skills of being effective in the workplace. I guess that's what it comes down to. Thank you. And a comment from Isabel here about currently experience that fostering teamwork and interaction provides for a very conducive learning environment. I think that's very much something you'd agree with, isn't it? Absolutely. And of course, what that means is uh, supporting learning in the workplace and learning in the workplace. Which, you know, 80% of the learning that all of us do is in the workplace, for good or ill, and, and, and it is learning which we develop together and co-construct. So teamworking is bound to be supportive of that if it's working well. I also think there was a very sound point made here by Emma and others that you've got to choose the right learning method for, for different things. So when you te uh, technical learning, that may be better in the classroom, yeah. some of the softer skills or other things on virtual environments here or coaching. Oh, I, I don't know. Well, I'd be very, very interested to know how softer skills are developed in an online environment. Uh, 
it's definitely something that we're thinking about here at the university, uh, at the Open University, uh, because we do, as, as you appreciate, most of our learning is online. So we're working very hard at thinking about how you do develop online skills and soft skills in an online environment. But what I think that probably means in practice is that you create, um, you help people through discussions online to think about how they apply skills in the workplace and reflect on them. So probably you, you, you'd be encouraging a practice-based approach to learning, I think. But yes, the general principle that you need to select um, the appropriate way of developing different types of learning is really important. However, for all of us, there are limitations. You know, a lot of learning increasingly is online, whether that's the best place to do it or not, because it, you know, it's, it's so much more convenient, it's only, the only way that's possible if you're not geographically co-located. So I think the thing with learning is to keep aware of what is possible, and for those of us whose job is to, to, to develop those learning opportunities, we keep working very hard at thinking about different ways of providing learning opportunities, which really work in practice. Well, we've now got the results of the poll, uh, which probably uh, play to some of the questions that we've just raised there about uh, how learning happens best. And coaching or mentoring is coming out way ahead at 54%. Learning on your own from your experience, 31.5%. Face-to-face courses, 12.9%. And learning in virtual environments, unfortunately, 1.6%. <laughs> That's something we'll have to think about there, I think. Well, I think that's really interesting, uh, really interesting. Um, and I would say 12% for face-to-face -face courses is quite high, actually. Um, okay. So yeah, and we're going to move on to our final video now, but hopefully we'll manage to pick up a few more questions uh, after that and before we have to finish. Your role as a line manager is inevitably demanding and pressurised. To do it well, you will need to be able to manage the pressures on your time and this means understanding how to prioritise and delegate and how to recognise and respond to the symptoms of stress. Setting priorities is an obvious way to deal with work pressures but can be hard to achieve in practice, not least because others will often regard their work as a priority even when you don't. Nevertheless, it helps to be clear what is urgent and just has to be done even if not necessarily perfectly, and what is important and really needs to be given good quality time so it is done really well. Delegation also helps, and again is harder than it sounds. Delegating means getting others to do work which is your responsibility, so you will still need to plan and monitor. On the other hand, you can't expect it to be done exactly as you would have done it, so perfectionism is very counterproductive. One of the great potential time stealers for any manager is meetings. It is well worth learning how to make good use of the time you spend in them, whether you are chairing or participating. As chair, if you make sure the mechanics of the meeting are done well, with a clear agenda, circulated in advance, with the right participants and proper supporting papers, you will have done a great favour to all involved. If you can chair the meeting well, keeping diversions from the agenda to a minimum, while giving everyone who needs to the chance to contribute, even better. As a participant, you should always be very clear why you are attending. If not, why are you there? However well you manage your time, you are very likely to experience some stress at work. In a recent report, published by the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, nearly half of respondents said that they had experienced stress in the previous 12 months. As a manager, the challenge is even greater since you will have to watch for and respond to stress in your team as well as in yourself. The symptoms of stress include tearfulness, irritability and sleep disturbance, but can take many other forms and are not always easy to spot, even in yourself. Often, you can manage stress by making sure you get time away from the workplace to recover. Exercise, hobbies, relaxing with family can all help. 
Sometimes you may need to ask for help though, even though this can be hard to do. Your employer may provide counselling support, or if not, you may find that your GP can help. You can find detailed guidance on identifying and managing stress on the website of the Health and Safety Executive. Thank you very much, Eileen. Uh, it's been a very useful half an hour. I hope um, you'll agree. Some fantastic questions. I'm afraid we're running very tight on, on time, um, but there's some interesting comments coming in about how to um, make better use of time. Use go to meetings, um, uh, go to meetings as opposed to going to them, uh, to actually help, uh, and some other thoughts there as to how we can sort of minimize stress and use time effectively. I'm really sorry that we have used time as effectively as we can, but we've, we've still run out of it here. So thank you very much, Eileen. Is there any sort of final comments you'd like to make before we have to close today? I'd just like to say it's been a great pleasure. And I, I wish we'd been able to answer more of your questions, which are really great. Um, perhaps we'll have another opportunity to discuss this matter in the future. Thank you very much. And we, have, uh, we will have some information about uh, the OU here, about how you can connect and find out more information about our courses. Uh, in particular, you might be interested in an MSc in uh, HR management that's, that's new to the OU, and also a very short course that's coming up around coaching, which seems to play into some of the questions that you were talking about there. Thank you very much for um, participating today. I'm sorry, I recognize that some of you have had sound issues, uh, but this webinar has been recorded and will be available for you to uh, download and play back at some other appropriate time. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry we didn't get to more questions. Good afternoon.